We don't have a perfect health system and actually getting scans on time can be difficult. But I had a really interesting thing happen to me about, about three months ago where I saw a scan result on someone I'd had the fortune to look after for eight years with a brain tumour and I knew the scan result was bad. I went, as I walked into the room, the patient said to me, my scan's bad, isn't it? I can read it in the way that you're walking. So I think we're all prey to the same things and actually we've got to work to try and make it as good for all of us. But it can be just as upsetting knowing a scan result for a weekend before you see the patient as, as it is for you all. And I think between us we have to work to make the health system work to the best for patients. Um, but it was very interesting for me because of all the communication courses I could do, I thought I can't change the way that I walk. <laughs> So the other reason I was anxious is my title was Novel Treatments and I was following Garth. It always gives an extremely good talk and in fact I think I'm hoping this will actually super embed on the talk that he, he gave to you because I really want to concentrate on where we are now. But if we think about novel treatments, what do we really mean? So often we mean new, don't we? Fresh, something that's coming, the wonder drug that's coming in, something original. But sometimes it might be looking at what we're doing already and are we using it properly? Now, I'm lucky there's a few people here from Addenbrooke's who know that my mum likes to keep me up to date. <laughs> and um, She sends me routinely the medical cuttings from the Daily Mail, <laughs> which I receive with great appreciation. But we all know the stresses and strains that we have with patients constantly wanting new treatments and we want to choose for them ideally the best treatments that we can give. And as I say, the Daily Mail is often is, you know, the wonder drug, the magic bullet. So, what I'm going to try and focus on in this talk is I'm going to mainly think about high-grade gliomas, but also a little bit more about the lower grades that we just heard about. And we heard already from Garth, there's been lots of studies done, but progress for brain has been relatively slow. We should actually also think there are some amazing success stories. In the last two or three years, brain tumour management has been revolutionised. Um, and then we need to think about what is the way forward and what is novel. And finally, of course, everything ideally should be centred around also what patients and carers need. So I think, again, when we think about novel approaches, you can't get a very good brain tumour service without all the right modalities. We do have to work with neurosurgeons, which is taxing. We do have to have, we have, to have excellent neuroradiology. We have to have excellent support with you all. We have to have you know, AHPs, radiographers, physios, OTs, nurses. And we have to have very good pathology and molecular diagnostics. Because without one of those components, we're not, we're not going to be as good as we could be. So what are the challenges? And these are the things I want to really think about now. So diagnosis, you think that'd be quite straightforward, wouldn't you? But I'll show you, not so. What about the environment that brain tumours are in? They're not an easy tumour. And we, are, we talk about patients, we ask patients, would you be reoperated on? The problem is, many of us know, each time you have a neurosurgical operation, there is risk of infection, deficit. And really what we must get better at, at knowing is, is quality of life. So those are the things we need to think about more. We need to think about glioma as not one thing. Glioblastoma is not one tumour. Grade, lower grade tumours are not the same. And then we, I'll do a quick, just to kind of reinforce the things that Garth showed you about where we are currently with studies. So let's think about diagnosis. Hands up who goes to an MDT tumour board. OK, so you'll all be really good at this, won't you? Because this is the one thing that you know what it is because it's the fried egg cell, isn't it? It's an oligodendroglioma. So... This should be easy. You know, it should have been easy with a, we've got very good description of brain tumours, haven't we? So this is an oligodendroglioma with those classical cells beautifully described. But this is also an oligodendroglioma. You can see the cells, then you can see why... I hate the fact that pathology often describe things like food, but you can see why they might say that. But you can see today that this tumour looks very different to that tumour. And we knew if you locked 15 pathologists into a room with 100 samples, many times they come out with different diagnoses. So that's what's changing. So in 2014, there was a very good consensus brought together that said there are now molecular markers that will help you with your diagnoses for some tumours which are difficult to categorise just by the way that they look. 
And that's led us on now to the update of the WHO uh, classification of brain tumours, which is shown here, which is pretty much the Bible for your pathologists. And when you go back to your departments today and your next tumour board, make sure that they've got the new version. It was published last week, and that has an updated guidance for not only um, malignant tumours, but also for meningioma, etc. And the reason is now is that the molecular changes, which I'm going to tell you about next, should be part of the diagnosis. So what we'll be looking at now is a more layered approach. So a bit like breast cancer, a bit like lung cancer. Well, you will have a description. You will also have a grade, but we know that grade doesn't necessarily always tell us what we want to know. And we'll have molecular information. Now, this is a sticking point, because at the moment in the UK, not every centre has access to molecular markers. And even in my centre, and I'm going to you know, sh sh show myself up to shame later, we don't get the results all at the same time. They take a while. So one of the things we need to do as in a community is to push that forward as being an important advance in helping us manage brain tumours to give them the information that patients need. So what do I mean by molecular markers? And I know that many people I work with, because I bang on and on about them, are thinking, gosh, I don't really know what they mean. So the big changes that have happened in the last two or three years are these things here. 1P19Q we've known about for a long time, but IDH1, we've used MGMT as well, and then these two new kids on the block, something called ATRX and TERT. So what about IDH1 and IDH2? The good thing for us in brain tumour practice is they're also important in haematology. So there'll be lots of drug work going on already in haematology, and lots of our successes are pulling in from other much better resourced um, cancers, so we've got to be smart with that. But we know that these are found as being expressed in many low-grade gliomas, and we already know that they um, can be looked and assessed easily. So this is an immunohistochemistry. The important thing to know about that, it's cheap. It costs £10 to order the antibody and do it on a, a sample. So you can get it in in your normal practice without having to mortgage your house for, the, for your NHS trust. So it's useful and it's implemented quickly. And we know already that it's a molecular marker that correlates with outcome. So it's something that's helpful right at the beginning to tell your patient. And just to show that here, this is a study I'll come back to in a little bit. But this is, just like Garth showed you earlier, this is patients here. And this is looking at um, stratifying patients between radiotherapy and chemotherapy and radiotherapy alone. And those that were IDH1 positive did better than those that weren't IDH1 positive. So we can know already from historical data that this is a marker that's going to be useful in the clinic. Um, not only in low grade, also in higher grade tumours, we know that a small number of glioblastoma will have IDH1 mutations, showing they've <coughs> developed probably from a lower grade lesion. But if you look at the outcome to treatment, the IDH1, which you can see here in the green, and also in the dark brownie colour here, it does correlate with the likelihood of how long patients are going to live. So it's something that we can utilise immediately in clinical practice that may help us in thinking about ideas of how long the patient is going to live. It doesn't tell us exactly, but it's moving things forward. So IDH1 will indicate often a better prognosis in low-grade glioma. It tells you it's a secondary glioblastoma if it's present. And it often goes hand in hand with the 1P19Q co-deletion. And as I said, there can be a rapid implementation into practice. One caveat is not all IDH1 mutations are the antibody-based test. About 4 to 5 percent need to be sequenced to prove that they're there, but that's a small number. So what about 1P19Q? We've known about this for a long time, and it's quite difficult really to explain what it is. It is something we can test for using a FISH test, and it should now be being done routinely, particularly for low grade, grade 2 and grade 3. I'm going to try and explain what it is because it's quite difficult. Um, back to our previous um, speaker, I'm in the middle of GCSEs at the moment, so I've had a little bit of revisiting chromosomes, so I thought this would be helpful. So normally we have uh, our two chromosomes, so this is uh, 1P and 19Q here. What happens is you can start to lose a bit of the genetic material. So you can see here um, there's a loss of this arm of the chromosome. There's a little bit of gain here. 
So the other thing to tell you about 1P19Q, it's not always that 1P19Q goes completely. You can get a mixture, which is then a bit difficult to interpret. But the sort of thing we're talking about is that finally, if you're doing that fish test, you've completely lost a bit of the chromosome. So that's what we test for. What does it do, though? We've got no idea. So it's a test for something that is a marker, which strongly correlates to outcome, which I'll show you in a second, but I can't tell you the underlying mechanisms or genes involved. But we know there were two very seminal papers uh, published in the last couple of years for grade 3 oligodendrug glioma, which looked at 1P19Q status. And this showed two things that I think are really important. One is the determination of the researchers. For most, the first half of my time treating brain tumours, we were understanding that if you added PCV to radiotherapy, there was no improvement in overall survival because the follow-up went to six years. The researchers went back, in fact there's data now going out to 14 or 15 years, and look at that, they widen out late on. So, and you can see clearly that the group that got PCV did slightly better than those just, that just got radiotherapy alone. And if you divide that data into those patients who had 1P19Q codeletion, there is a clear big difference. And we heard that already with the patient's story. So this is a useful test. It can be done at the moment in two or three weeks. That should may be OK. But it is easily translatable into clinical practice, and we should be doing it routinely. I ultimately hope it will have a huge impact even on the DVLA, which you know takes quite a long time to undertake changes. <laughs> and the latest news just published this year is that um, the impact of chemotherapy with low-grade gliomas may also have the same effect. So this is for grade 2 glioma, so we're pretty confident that our grade 3s but if you've got a grade 2 glioma, again, this is the graph I showed you before, there is likely to be a benefit from adding in adjuvant PCV. The data on the 1P19Q separation is not quite so solid. The only other thing that I would add as a caveat, of course, is we don't have good follow-up of cognitive outcome and quality of life. Because, of course, the more we do, the more we risk uh, patients' quality of life, and we'll come back to that briefly at the end. So the other two new mutations that are available, there's something called a TERP mutation, which can be very helpful now in discriminating often with um, whether patients have a, a de novo, actually, glioblastoma, which I'll show you on a graph, and also ATRX, which can be helpful in a new classification. The beauty, again, of ATRX is like um, IDH1. It's an immunohistochemistry test. So it's quick, it's easy, and it's not expensive. Um, so... What, what's happened is, and this can be a bit confusing for patients also, is that the classification that's just come out will now divide um, tumours into either being a type of astrocytoma or oligodendroglioma, and the mixed entity, which was present, is now removed. And already I've had patients saying to me, I'm an oligoastro, but I no longer exist. What does that mean? <laughs> So again, it's about coping with that and adjusting for it. But I think you can see already that this is, this is novel because it's based on information that we have and we can now use it in the clinic. It's new and we should be using it. And one of the things that drives me, that gets me out of bed in the morning, is that I hope before I retire that we can start to look at glioma treatment a bit like breast cancer, that we can start to stratify patients and give them treatment accordingly. And this graph gives me hope at some stage we'll be able to do this. So this is looking at a group of low-grade tumours, and what you can see is that if you only have a TERP mutation, you don't have any of the other abnormal features, actually, although the histology looks like a low-grade, it's actually a glioblastoma and should be treated as a glioblastoma. If you have all three of the um, 1P19Q, TERT and IDH1, actually you fall into a very good prognosis and we need to be very careful about how we give you the radiotherapy and how we give chemotherapy to make sure the long-term outcome in cognition and quality of life is as good as possible. In this group here, 
we probably need to intensify our treatment. So these should be treated, we should be looking at more adding in extra radiotherapy and chemotherapy possibly. But it allows us to move forward in the way that we plan our clinical trials. So let's think about environment. This is actually a garden in Tenerife. My husband booked a holiday and I was a bit sniffy about it when he said it was Tenerife, but it was lovely. So, um, but, so let's think about the environment. So the biggest problem we have, and it's a problem that's dogged my whole time in, in looking after brain tumours, and it'd be the same with Garth, everyone worries about the blood-brain barrier. Nobody wants to give drugs because it won't cross the blood-brain barrier. And of course, it does prevent many substances getting to, through to tumours, but of course here, the blood-brain barrier is actually completely, it's not, it's, it's not working. So we know um, many trials in the past have not addressed this aspect. Um, we know it's affected by radiotherapy and new vessel formation. And in fact, the trial that Garth mentioned, operatic, is looking not only at sampling drug in the tumour, but it also takes samples from around the edge of the tumour, which we know is important, to tell us more about that. So I think, I'm hoping that the pharma companies are becoming a bit more relaxed, but it's been a barrier for many years about taking new drugs. And, and not many medical oncology specialists have brain as part of their portfolio, so they're very anxious about taking trials into brain tumours. And what about heterogeneity? Well, I mentioned this before. There's been an explosion of genetics. And again, you know, sorry to the Addenbrooke's crew, but I'm always banging on about it. But actually, there's so much more now that we know. And we know, for example, that glioblastoma isn't just one glioblastoma. Um, and we also, uh, and I'll, I'll spare you this one, for many years we've do been dominated by a cancer stem cell theory, which seems to have fallen out of favour. But uh, we could talk for days about that. But what we do know is that we're not dealing with one disease. And perhaps a way to, ex to explain this, and excuse me again, it's going back to my uh, revision for biology, so you start off with a glioblastoma, for example, and over time, you may find that you'll get clones that will stay very similar, but because it's such a heterogeneous disease, you may, by the time that the disease recurs, have a disease that has no correlation in terms of the genetic sequencing to the one that you started off with. And to know more about that, we need to draw in Garth and other colleagues around the country to make sure we get tissue banking from presentation and also relapse. So what about the limitations then? I know I'm trying to be novel, but why have we had struggles for getting any progress with glioblastoma? Part of it is us. We're guilty of actually all trying to approach the same patients. So this is a lovely uh, bit of data that came from um, sort of the National uh, Cancer Registry. And this is showing diagnosis of glioblastoma. It shows we know sorry for the small number of men in the room, slightly more common in men, um, much less common at younger ages, and then rises to a peak here, so in our 70s and 80s. So the problem with that is, all the studies I'm telling you about relate to this group here. And you'll know it from your clinic. We all want the same people. We want the young, fit, totally resected people. How many of that how many of those people, though, represent, for example, glioblastoma? Now, we all know, don't we, we discuss 30, 40 people every week in our MDT. Um, but in terms of the number of patients with glioblastoma that come to craniotomy, this was doing a snapshot of our local MDT, about 40 to 50% will have a craniotomy and resection. About 10% will have a biopsy. But 30 to 40% will have no treatment at all. They won't even come to see us. So that's a really high number. So there's a huge proportion of patients that we don't even yet consider for clinical trials that is an unmet need that we need to think about. So what about recurrent? You know, what about the other things? So we, you know, in the past, and you know, I've done lots of trials, we've grouped everyone into the same group of patients, haven't we? But we know in the clinic there are some differences. So one of the things we're all looking at is imaging and molecular profiling, because can we work out which patients are going to recur, where are they going to recur, and when are they going to recur? So we still know, and I think this still holds, and this is some data I'm going to show you from our own region in East Anglia, that 80 to 90% of glioblastoma patients will recur within two centimetres of where, or the, actually the area that you've treated them originally. 
So this is a, an MRI here. It shows a very good resection of the glioblastoma and just a little bit of post-operative swelling which settles. And then hopefully this is projecting here. You can see that there's recurrence exactly where the tumour originally was. So the most of our patients still recur right in the middle of where we've treated them. Some patients, though, will recur um, a little bit further away than their original tumour. So here you can see there's been a resection here, a little bit of contrast enhancement, but later on the patient recurs not exactly where the tumour was, but really on the edge, and it's gone through the corpus callosum. So this would suggest to me that our imaging wasn't good enough for this case, that we couldn't see that there actually was more cells there than we, orig you know, we originally knew about, because this is a sort of marginal relapse, and you could get better at that with better imaging. And then there's the patient who will recur far, far away. So this is um, somebody who's got disease here, and then the disease recurs over here, and it's quite hard to even make a connection of how that could happen. And if I just show you where this, the data's come from, this is a, a 34 cases that we've treated. And the red bars show that the majority of patients had adequate treatment from the radiotherapy in the sense of the relapse was in that volume. A very small number relapsed way outside of where we treated them, and that group needs a different approach altogether. The group with the blue bars are those that are relapsing right on the edge of the radiotherapy, and that needs better imaging. But hopefully this conveys to you that they're not all the same. And actually there's lots of different approaches that we can try and improve. So for the local disease, we need optimum surgery and think about focal improvements in our focal treatment. For this group, we probably need better drug therapy. But in the past, they've all been in the same trials. Just a brief moment, just going to catch up in time. This is the Bridge of Size at St John's where you uh, walk over when you're about to do your exams. That's not, I can't punt, I'm too short. OK, so let's try and have a bit of a, an update on where we are in advances in glioma. So um, Garth showed you this, um, and I think he, he made a very poignant point. We were very excited by this data because it was the first time that we saw an improvement in management of glioma. But if any other cancer specialist showed that survival curve, they, you know, we've got to get it better, haven't we? So um, temozolomide was a very good advance, but we've still got a long way to go. The, the marker that was useful here was MGMT. That's its proper name, which I well, can't say. And it can be tested clinically. be interesting to know around the room how long it takes. In our own hands, it takes two or three weeks, um, which can obviously affect decision-making. The other annoyance with uh, MGMT, it's not a yes it's not a yes-no test, is it? There's a cut-off, so there's a grey area, which can sometimes cause us clinical concern. Um, and as you've seen this again before, though, it will help you guide patients in terms of their management for two reasons. If they're MGMT methylated, they are more likely to respond to radiotherapy and chemotherapy. They're also more likely to get the uh, condition of pseudoprogression. So it's helpful, and we should have it at our fingertips when we're seeing <coughs> patients. Um, so this is my first confession. There is data that tells us that in patients who are over 65, if a patient is MGMT methylated, they will do just as well with primary temozolomide as they would, um, and perhaps even slightly better than primary radiotherapy. If they're unmethylated, then primary radiotherapy is their best point of call. So I've even written an article about that. But because our MGMT methylation turnaround is still too slow, we don't use it yet routinely in clinical practice. So it's something we need to do, and it's something we're working on as we speak. So temozolomide, Garth told you, why was it successful? Well, it wasn't designed for brain tumour treatment. It had actually been knocking around in phase one studies, and some activity was seen in brain. It is lipophilic, so it crosses the blood-brain barrier, and we suspect radiotherapy probably improves that. So actually, it was by chance that it has been the best improvement we've seen in brain tumours. And similarly, PCV. It's a really active regimen. Do we need all the PCV? Well, in, in, we're wedded to it in the UK. In Europe, you just get the C. The CCNU is probably the most effective ingredient. But it is the standard arm for most studies, and the reason why is... 
that type of survival curve. You know, that's the good news. It's novel in the sense we now know it's there and it's relatively recent and we need to make sure everyone is using it. So then it brings us on to the perhaps not so good news stories. Again, um, for many years Avastin was thought to be a great hope for us and I was one of the people hoping sincerely that it would be. We hoped it would be good in first line, we hoped it would be good in second line and just recently we hoped it might be in good in combination with CCNU. But I'm sorry to say that uh, none of it has worked. So uh, it has been tried extensively and although the science behind it all made sense, it didn't translate into clinical benefit. There's been lots of uh, looking at the VEGF receptor, which is overexpressed in a small number of glioblastoma. So many of these trials have not worked, mainly because about 3 to 4% of patients may have, may have that mutation and it's been tried in 100%. So when we think about way forward, we're going to need much more specific targeted trials. So in terms of ways forward now, when we think about the markers that we have, there, is, there are studies underway looking at whether we can manipulate IDH1 and IDH2. It's very early days, um, but it could be a drug route that could be explored. 1P19Q loss... We've got it. We know the treatment. It's radiotherapy and adjuvant PCV. Of course, we might get to the point where we might ask, does chemotherapy alone work on its own? So that we de-intensify risk for patients that fall into that very good prognosis category. But that has to be done carefully and would need very large studies. Coming back to that pr premise of targeting patients, we know that there are specific gene mutations that will occur in some glioblastoma, so there's a particular BRAF mutation, 6 to 10% of glioblastoma. There's also a TAC fusion for which there is a drug. So these are small numbers, and they're all being looked at in small studies. But the only way we'll move that forward, as I say, is to have the type of design that Gar showed you, where you have kind of basket trial design, where you look to see which drugs could target which mutation, as long as the mutation is there. It also, need, if you've got someone in recurrence, it needs to be there in the recurrence as well as obviously in the primary disease. And you know, these are hard to do without it being a big multi centre study. Um, in terms of other trials that are going on, obviously immunotherapy, again, I know I'm getting old now because immunotherapy was very popular about 15 years ago and it's had a, a new rena renaissance. But um, there is a new trial coming with, which uses an oncolytic rear virus intravenously called RioGlio, which will be opening later in the year. You say DCVAX has stopped at the moment, and IMA950 and ACT4 have both completed, but we're waiting further follow up data. Again, a small percentage of glioblastoma, I'm sure, can be modulated by immune therapy, but it won't be all of them. Um, Garth mentioned the operatic and uh, paradigm studies which are looking at enhancing radiation and there's also the hydroxychloroquine study that some of you may know which tries to increase the way cells are killed by a mechanism called autophagy. So these are the trials that we have available to us at the moment. You also mentioned nanoparticles. I had the privilege to uh, examine someone's uh, PhD on gold nanoparticles which I must say took me a long time to read and even understand. But uh, you can get nanoparticles into the brain, so it, and gold can then be irradiated, and you increase the radiation uh, damage by activating the nanoparticles. So that may be uh, something to watch out for as a new kind of novel therapy. So what is the way forward for treating glioma? As I've mentioned to you, my aim is to be able at some point to be able to sit with the patient early on and to be able to accurately put them into a group with a targeted type of therapy that's going to be best for them. We're not there yet and I say the biggest driver in terms of novel treatment is we've got to get the UK on board to get all of these molecular markers done in a site that often isn't well represented in terms of funding etc. But that's for us to do. So we have, we have to make sure we use the best of what we have. So we have to counsel the patients well at the beginning. When we're doing trials, we have to make sure we have a robust design for the future. And ideally, we need to risk stratify patients um, and ensure that all groups are represented. Because my main caveat is, of course, is you know, 
I'm all tied up with the trial and the radiotherapy treatment. I'm not the one getting the phone calls and seeing them, you know, not getting on so well with treatment. So again, I think sometimes it's important for us to make sure we're involved with all, all different types of design of trials. What I thought would be interesting is that um, many of you have seen there are uh, a, a very good association called the James Lind Alliance, which pulled together basically things that are priority for patients and carers. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's useful, particularly as a clinician, to think about how well do we cover those. So I've just got a few on the screen here. So one of the things came up in the top ten, which was molecular subtyping techniques. So that's great. We're actually trying to address that. These are a few of the others. Extent of resection. So again, many of us are addressing that. And the Elaparib study will be helpful. And there are calls for designs of surgical trials looking at whether... If you haven't resected the tumour and you intended to, should you go back in and re-resect? But what about fatigue? Well, we heard a beautiful talk on fatigue. Are there any clinical trials or any things going for that? Not at the moment, because those are the ones that can often be difficult to fund, but it's something we should look into. This is really important, isn't it? Long-term physical and cognitive effects. Very difficult to do, and those original grade 3 papers that show that stellar survival benefit only really did the mini mental test score mm. that tells you nothing about cognitive effect and addressing these issues mm. with our normal grant funding structure that you need 10 15 years follow-up are almost impossible um, early referral to specialist palliative care there's a few papers that are nicely written that shows that often the big difficulty for patients is that they have a very long exposure to us in hospital and then when in the sort of terminal phases of disease, everything is handed over to GP and palliative care. And we often don't really address the handover and how we do that as well as we can. And hopefully we'll hear a bit more about that for the next speaker. How do we help carers cope? There's little published data about that. And then again, it's an area that we should think more about. And then second recurrence of glioblastoma. You know, if you see the surgeon, the surgeon will take it out. But is that really the best way to go? We don't know. Could we ever do a trial that says randomised between resection chemo, chemo only? They're difficult to do, but they're questions we actually don't know. We assume often further surgery is right, but we don't know. And that's a, a great area calling out for, for new trials. <coughs> so this is a slide just to berate myself, really. So this is um, an MRI showing a very extensive glioblastoma involving the corpus callosum. Now, it's very likely that patient will be very debilitated. They'll come to the MDT, they'll never see a neuro-oncologist, and they may not even get much support in the community. And this represents the massive group of patients I think we <coughs> never even get to us, and we'll never even, we can't even think about including into a clinical trial but it's something that we need to, to think about because it's still often the majority of patients who don't get into the groups to be studied on. So is it novel? Well, as I said, you can define novel in different ways. I think Garth showed you the novel uh, treatment approach, so hopefully my talk will have interlinked with his. So what we've talked about, though, is that we've got lots of drugs that we weren't using properly, and now we know how to use them. We've got some new drugs that I think are coming, and I'm still an optimist that they will improve things. But we need to use our current techniques in the best way that we can. So that's radiotherapy, which is still the best treatment uh, for glioblastoma. And I think the molecular era is here for glioblastoma and low-grade gliomas. And I've just had the one-minute sign, but I suspect most of you now are feeling like this. <laughs> Thank you very much.